Okay, so tonight's program is called Wild About Roses. Um, this is kind of a hot topic depending on who you talk to. Um, I have yet to be in a place in Indiana that doesn't grow roses. Uh, my family regularly got into their own fights with trying to grow tea roses and other hybrids when I was growing up, and I'm sure a lot of you have too. So what I'm going to discuss tonight is I'm going to go over a little bit about the proper care and maintenance of your roses. And I want to make sure that you all understand that there are a lot of varieties of roses out there. So it's hard to make a general rule that's going to apply to everything. So I'm going to say that this program should be taken with the caveat of based on the type of rose that you are growing. If you are growing some interesting hybrid that's been in your family for however many years, you're going to want to look at that more closely. However, if you're just growing basic tea roses or something you can get out of a garden store, then most likely everything you see here tonight is going to apply to you pretty safely. So I'm just going to jump right in here and talk a little bit about watering. So one of the questions that we regularly get, and I've seen this at programs and just talking to clients, that the idea of watering is a little bit misunderstood. Um, a lot of us will simply just take a good bucket of water when it's hot outside and dump it on the plants we care about, and we figure that's going to be okay. And I've discovered as I've done more and more programs throughout this summer that that isn't necessarily the truth. So I want to make sure you guys have some decent information on how to water roses. So to start, roses need good drainage. You can't let your roses sit in soup for too long. Unfortunately, there are a lot of diseases that can affect them that are based on the moisture that they undergo, and I'm going to talk about those in a little bit. Now you'll see on this slide I say they not only need good drainage, but they need abundant water, which may seem a little bit like an oxymoron. How can you keep something well drained and keep it thoroughly watered at all times? Well, the idea is to make sure that the soil is moist but never saturated. You don't want a muddy soup. You just want good, moist soil there so you can make sure the roses have plenty of water to work with and nutrients can be transported easily. You're looking for a thorough, deep water to ensure that the soil is penetrated. You're getting all of the root systems that can be in that rose bush. But you want to make sure that when you water roses, don't sprinkle water overhead. I know a lot of us rely on a hose sprinkler or something similar to help us water our plants, but I'm just going to say right now, if this is a habit that you're into, you probably want to go ahead and stop that. If water sits on the leaves of roses, that's an excellent way to get an infection. And if I go back a slide here where we started, if you look at some of these roses, you could see there is water on some of the flowers in the picture on the right side. That's not something you want to necessarily see because that means that if the rose gets injured or if there's a particularly aggressive pathogen, that water can help that move forward and eventually infect your rose. Now mulching is another question that I've gotten quite a bit on a lot of these programs throughout the summer. Mulching is one of those things that, again, is fairly misunderstood. I can't count the number of times where I've seen somebody spread just a light, thin mulch over whatever they're doing and think that's okay. But in the reality, when it comes to roses, you want to make sure that more is actually better. So what we normally recommend is some form of organic mulch, wood chips that have been untreated, um, things like that, compost, so that way you could protect that soil and that organic material will begin to contribute into the nutrient profile of that soil. When you mulch, you want to get it two to three inches deep. That's going to help you control weeds. What will happen is, since that mulch is so thick, the weeds will have a much more difficult time growing through the mulch. Now, if you've lived in Indiana for any amount of time, you know that we do have weeds that might actually be able to get through that. So what I would add to this is you're going to want to monitor after you put that mulch over. Make sure that you are eliminating anything that pokes through it that you don't want quickly. Don't let them get easily established. The depth of the mulch should help control that quite a bit, but don't treat it as a cure-all. You want to keep watching. Now, when you put mulch around roses, you don't want that mulch right up to the rose plant. You want a good six inch radius around the stem of the plant. Now, the reason for this is we were just talking about watering. This will make a nice kind of bowl shape 
where when you water the roses, the water will sit right there in that little bowl you've made with the mulch, and it'll drain down into the root system exactly where you want it to go. That way, it's not distributing out across the soil surface. It's getting exactly where you want it to be. Now, fertilizer. This one is always a big question. Um, some people don't believe in using fertilizer, and depending on the plant, that's perfectly fine. But in the case of roses, roses are very hardy feeders. You need to fertilize your roses. So I'm going to start a little bit with some basic requirements. Like I said, roses have some high nutrition requirements. And before you even put a single plant in the ground, get your soil tested. If you've been at one of my programs before, you are probably tired of hearing me say this, but it is one of the best, smartest steps that you can take. And if you're from any of my areas, I'm in Clay and Owen counties, you can call me and ask me where to get that done and I will help you figure out what to do. Your extension educators in your other counties will also be able to do this. Get a soil test, save yourself the headache. Now, when it comes to roses, you can use an organic, an inorganic, or a combination of both in terms of fertilizers. Um, I like the idea personally of using both because an inorganic fertilizer will be more targeted towards those nutrients that may be missing or may have a higher requirement. Whereas organic fertilizers will also produce that good whole profile that will help improve your soil. So let's talk a little bit about the two types of fertilizers that we want to use here. Now when we're looking at organic fertilizer, we want to look for those fertilizers that have a higher phosphorus value. That's what roses are really going to need. And if you're not sure how to find that information, look at a bag of fertilizer you could buy at a Lowe's or somewhere like that. You'll see that it has three numbers on it, usually something like 444 or 484. What that is, is it's telling you the content of each nutrient in the order of nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. We're looking for that middle number, the phosphorus value. You want one that has a higher phosphorus value. Now, if you can't find one like that, if you get a bag of fertilizer that has all equal numbers, like that 444 four, four that I mentioned, that should be okay. That should still work for you. You just want to make sure you don't overuse it so you don't burn your plants. Now, when you're applying an organic fertilizer, our current recommendation is using about 3 pounds per 100 square feet, which comes out to be about one heaping tablespoon per plant. You want to make sure that when you apply your fertilizer, that first application should be in the spring after the last frost. If you put it on before the last frost, that fertilizer is going to sit on top as it freezes and it won't go into the soil like you want it to. Don't attempt to fertilize your roses after July. So right now, it's too late to fertilize. The reason for this is, is that we want these plants to harden. And if we keep contributing nutrients into them after July, that means that we're fooling the plant into thinking the year isn't progressing like it should be, so it won't begin to harden. Hold off on the fertilizer for now and let them harden, and they'll survive the winter much better. So let's talk a little bit about some organic fertilizers. Now, aged manure seems to be an excellent choice for using as a fertilizer. You're going to want to make sure, however, that it is aged. If you use fresh manure, the high nitrogen content in that manure can cause the plant to burn. And that's something you want to avoid. That can cause permanent damage. When you use an organic fertilizer, spread it to the depth of about two to three inches. This will allow nature to do its work. The fertilizer will decompose and contribute its material into the soil so that way your plants are more effectively fed. Liquid fish, bone meal, blood meal, all of these things also make reasonable quality fertilizers, though I believe personally the best one is going to be getting some manure. And if you're in a rural part of Indiana, you're probably going to be able to find that fairly easily and at reasonable cost. All right, liming. This is another one that's pretty important because uh, that acidic soil is what your roses are going to need. This is again why you want to get that soil test done. Roses are going to want soil that is slightly acidic, 5.5 to 6.5. 
Uh, you'll know you're kind of right in the right ballpark if you're growing something like raspberry canes because those will also rely on fairly acidic soil if you are looking for something to indicate. But again, get that soil test done. Now, if you need to raise the pH, which is probably one of the more common issues that we see, ground limestone works very well, and it'll also supply the plants with calcium. If you need to lower the pH, you can use ground sulfur at the rate that you see there, eight ounces per 100 square feet. However, I will say that it's pretty rare that we see an instance where you need to lower the ground pH. Here in Indiana, most likely, you're probably already fine. Our soil is typically a little bit acidic, so I'm guessing you won't need to worry about this unless you've had some other events happen within your soil profile. Okay, this is the biggest question I get asked about roses, and I had to do a little research myself to make sure that I wasn't going to lead you guys astray. Pruning roses is one of those instances where it's going to be really dependent on the type of rose you have. I'm just going to go over the general rules, and if you guys have questions about particular varieties, uh, send them to me after the program, and I can try to address those individually because it will be a little bit tailored to that plant. Now, what I first say is that if you're going to prune a rose, don't take the, the uh, snippers to it if it's weak or small. Now, you can, and that can help encourage growth. However, if you choose to do so, make sure that you've accounted for whatever is making that rose not develop correctly. Make sure that if you decide to, because when we prune it, it is going to be intentional damage that we do, when you do that damage, that the rose is equipped to be able to survive the damage. Now, in general, I prefer to just avoid pruning them if the plant is already in trouble. Because if it has a disease, if there's a lack of nutrition, that means that that damage could lead to an even bigger problem and I could lose the plant. Now, when we talk about pruning roses, we most typically talk about deadheading. Now, for those of you who don't know, deadheading is when we remove a fading flower from a rose to prevent it from going to seed. Now, not all roses, however, is, are going to have that done to them. Sometimes we want rose hips there to be a part of our display. And you're going to want to make sure you take that into account when you're thinking about pruning or deadheading. Now, when you do go ahead and prune this, you want to make sure you prune it back to the nearest outfacing bud above a five or seven leaflet leaf. And I highly recommend that maybe you consider looking up a diagram or at least monitoring how your rose is growing so that way you know exactly where to go ahead and prune. But just keep that in mind, an outward facing bud above a five or seven leaflet leaf. Now do not attempt to prune your roses after October 1. When we prune our roses, it causes a reaction in the plant that will help it grow, they can make it bushier, it can improve growth, but we don't want that to happen after the 1st of October. When I looked it up, the predicted frost date coming up for us in Indiana, in our area, is going to be October 9th. So we are in West Central, sort of more Southern Indiana, for those of you who may not be from this area. You don't want to prune right then so that way that plant can harden. You don't cause it to go into some kind of growth cycle and it can be ready for that first frost on October 9th. Okay, so for those of you who have been to my programs before, you know I talk a lot about diseases and I talk a lot about insects. Now I'm going to go over several diseases of roses. I'm not covering them all. There are a few that were left off of here just to not overkill everything with information. So I'm going to try to hit ones that I have personally seen in the roses in my yard and some of the ones that I know you are dealing with. The first one I'm going to talk about is unfortunately one I have in my yard called black spot. Now this disease can cause the leaves to die off and it can also cause cane dieback. What's causing this is a fungal disease that is getting into all the tissues of the plant. The black spots you see there are where the fungus is, has developed to the point where it's almost ready to produce fruiting bodies, so it can produce spores and reproduce. You may also identify this disease from reddish purple spots on the cane. 
And I've definitely seen that as a symptom throughout the areas that I work in. Now, the way you can try to manage this is to avoid splashing water. This is why I was saying earlier, don't sprinkle water over your roses. You will save yourself some trouble. Now, that being said, um, recently we had a spate of storms go through that were pretty intense. So unfortunately, that could create a situation where we could see a disease like this begin within our roses. So you're going to want to monitor. Uh, I don't know if everyone on here experienced the storm we had this last weekend. It was very, very intense. So I would say that if you're within the uh, Vigo, Clay, Owen area, even as high as Putnam County, I, you are going to want to keep an eye on your roses if you got rain. Powdery mildew is another disease. This one's very common. It is spread across multiple species of plants. Um, I talked about this a little bit when I was going over different vegetables and protecting them in a previous program, so you may have heard me talk about it a little bit before. This picture uh, pretty much says it all. What you'll see is that leaves will begin to distort, they will twist, their colors will begin to change, and you will begin to see a white powdery substance develop on the surface of the leaf. Now that white powdery substance you see there is where the fungus is actually developing, again, spores, those fruiting bodies to help it reproduce. Unlike uh, the previous disease we talked about, which develops on the lower leaves, this disease, powdery mildew, will develop on the upper leaves first. So keep that in mind. Let's go back a few slides. So if you see this disease, this black spot, it's going to start on the lower portion of the plant first. But if we move to our powdery mildew, we're going to see it develop on the upper portion of the plant first. So that's one way you'll be able to tell those two apart. Now the growth of this particular disease is encouraged by warm days, which are followed by cooler, more humid nights. And unfortunately, we have had quite a few of those for the last month and a half. Uh, unfortunately, this summer has produced kind of a perfect storm of conditions for a lot of our diseases of many different plants, and this, our roses are not an exception to this. So I would definitely be closely monitoring this. Now, all of these fungal diseases that I've gone over and the ones that I will go over, there are many different fungicides that you can use to treat them. There are several brand names under which they can operate. So if you are interested in using a fungicide, email me after this program and we can talk about that a little bit. Stem canker is a disease that I've not covered yet before in any of my programs. Um, I haven't gone over many bushy or shrub-like plants so far. Uh, stem canker, however, is a distortion of the stems of the plants, where it develops lesions or cankers over it. And this picture illustrates that fairly well. You can see those odd brown striations that have developed on the stem. Now, this is usually represented by what I described there, those brown oval shapes on the canes themselves. However, stem canker may not actually present with the actual cankers. What you will see if that happens is you'll see the canes begin to die off and, and the leaves on those canes will begin to wilt outwards. And that's a sign of stem canker that you can use. You may also see black specks form along the border of the canker. Again, there's that sign of a fungal infection. It's those fruiting bodies and spores. So to help with this, avoid covering your roses early. If you cover your roses early, it could trap moisture in the, say, styrofoam container, like the ones that my mom likes to cover her roses with. And what'll happen is that'll just sit in there the entire winter season, and then when you take it off of there, you've got this fungal pathogen that has been covering your roses throughout the entire winter, and it'll really get going the next spring. Okay, botrytis blights. This is a disease that you have heard me mention before if you've been to any of my other programs. This is one that can strike uh, plants such as tomatoes and cucumbers, and it will hit roses. However, this is kind of one of our bright spots amongst rose diseases. Usually when botrytis blight hits, it's attacking tissue that is already dying. So if you've got fading rose flowers, most likely botrytis will attack those first than anything else. Uh, however, if the infection is intense enough, it will go after the healthy tissue. 
So if you're going to be deadheading your plants and getting those fading flowers off of there, you're going to want to jump on that early to make sure that that material isn't transmitting a disease into the healthy, still living portions of the plant. Now this can develop best under moist conditions. So if it gets more humid and we get more rain, you'll see it really begin to develop. We usually refer to this as gray mold. And you've heard me refer to that in other programs before too, as a gray mold infection. Now this one is a little bit easier to manage. You can avoid this entire problem through good sanitation. Clean up leaves, get rid of dead petals, get rid of any dead or dying canes, make sure that your soil hasn't just been infested with the spores from this disease, and you can probably prevent most of your problems. But if you allow your plants to shed whatever dead material they're going to and just leave it there on the ground, and I know some people have treating it as though we're going to help add to the composting that's going on there, that's not a good idea because the risk of disease transmission is just too high. Take everything off the, that ground, keep it clean, keep the soil sanitized, and of course, keep your tools sanitized too. Make sure you're cleaning after you use them. Okay, here is the black cloud, unfortunately, with no silver lining on it, rose mosaic virus. This disease is characterized by exactly what you're seeing here on these leaves, this mosaic pattern of yellowing on the leaves. You can often see it also sticking to the leaf veins as well. Now, unlike the other diseases that I've talked about so far, this one is an actual virus. This one is transmitted usually through insect feeding. So the best way to control this disease is to make sure that you keep the insects under control. Normally, this disease is transmitted by an insect such as an aphid, which uses its mouth parts to drain sap, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more later. Uh, the aphids, however, when they put their mouth parts into plants, they make a good transmission vector of viruses, and unfortunately that can be spread all over to each plant those aphids visit. So make sure you're monitoring your insects closely. Excuse me, I just skipped a slide. So, like I said, we will usually see yellowing lines along veins. That's going to be one of the most prominent symptoms of this disease. However, like one of the other illnesses I've already talked about, this may not actually occur. You may not get that symptom to help you out. What you can use is watch your roses. If they begin to stunt and weaken, like a previously healthy plant was doing great and now it's not, that would be a moment where I'd be concerned about having rose mosaic virus. Now I said this is a black cloud with no silver lining, and unfortunately the reason for that is there is no cure. There is no effective management of rose mosaic virus. The only management option you have is control those insects, reduce the chance of infection. Okay, this was an unusual disease um, that I had to learn about a little bit, and you've got to admit that is a very strange looking plant right there. Well, what you're seeing is an example of rose rosette disease, and this can occur within roses throughout Indiana. Um, I think someone may have talked a little bit about this in chat. They may have this issue, and I'm going to address that in a little bit, but let's talk about the disease first. This one is an unusual one in that we haven't actually identified the pathogen that initiates this disease, but we do know that it is spread by a type of mite. Now the disease is characterized by this witch's broom it's referred to as, a kind of rapid growth where the plant just suddenly stops growing the way it should. And let's take a closer look at that picture again. You can see here that all of the leaves and even the canes and the, the actual flowers their growth is completely distorted. Um, this thing is just growing wildly out of control, and if I didn't know that this was being caused by a rosette disease, I would have said that someone had applied 2,4-D on this plant, which is a plant growth regulator and has a very similar effect. Now, when the disease occurs in a plant, the plants will decline, and unfortunately, they cannot be cured. Your only option to solve this is to destroy that plant. Get it out of your soil. Don't let that plant come into contact with anything else. Get rid of it. So that way you could save any other healthy plants around it. 
All right, so I have mentioned at least one insect so far, and there are a few that I want to cover this evening. Um, for those of you who don't know, I am an entomologist, and I do love talking about my insects. I know you may not be very familiar with them like I am, so if you have any questions, please feel free to ask. Now, the thing about insects is very similar to the thing about all of our diseases. There is rarely a silver bullet solution, and oftentimes, even pesticides that we may not want to apply may not necessarily be that effective. So it's going to take a lot of work, and this is going to be work that's going to take place over a series of years to try to get all of your insects under control. Now, the damage that we see being done by insects is usually represented in one of two ways. We see insects consuming leaf tissue, or we see insects draining sap out of plants. This is done by a combination of native and invasive species. For those of you who don't know, an invasive species is one that is not native to our area, so our plants and animals have not developed defenses against them like in their native habitat. And the last thing that I'm going to say for just general rules about insects is that sometimes the best solution is to do nothing. Yeah, the insect may be eating plant tissue, but is it actually doing real damage that is going to cause the plant to become unhealthy or decline? And sometimes that answer is no. So let's jump into a few insects here. This is one that I have already mentioned. This is called an aphid, and I'm sure a lot of you have seen plenty of aphids before. This is a small, soft-bodied insect. It's a very, very unusual insect. It's a part of a group that feeds through syringe-like mouth parts known as a rostrum. And if we have any master gardeners on here, they can probably tell you all about this. And what they'll do is they'll take those syringe-like mouth parts, that rostrum, and inject them into the tissue of a plant and begin feeding on the sap. Their diet is very sugary because of that. So you'll see aphids exude a sugary substance out of their bodies, referred to as honeydew. And when it hits plant surfaces, it can often cause sooty mold to develop because the sugar acts as a food source for a type of mold. Now aphids don't generally move around very much. And when they begin feeding, they are kind of like cattle. They are going to sit there and they are going to feed for 10 to 15 minutes at a time. And they cannot move while their mouth parts are in that plant. I mentioned aphids are unusual, and the reason for that is that aphids reproduce through a process called parthenogenesis when they are in a plant feeding stage. This means that a single female aphid is going to reproduce her own daughter clone. She doesn't actually mate with anything, she just reproduces without having mated. And the child that she has is an exact genetic duplicate of herself. This is why one day you'll go out and you'll see 10 aphids, and the next day you'll find 100. They go through this process very, very quickly. And like I said earlier, these aphids spread disease very, very easily because those mouth parts are being injected into a plant. They can feed on a diseased plant, and if they move to a new one, they can easily spread that disease to the next plant. Now, Japanese beetles. This is one that a lot of us hate to see, but unfortunately it's one that we kind of have to live with. This is one of our invasive species. Japanese beetles are really well known because of exactly what you see here. They like to skeletonize the leaves of plants. Now when they do this, they typically leave a lot of the structure of veins and other things behind. They're going for that soft tissue that they can more easily consume. Now the good thing is, is that Japanese beetles can be controlled through pesticides, but unfortunately a lot of pesticides they've developed resistance to. One thing I want to address about Japanese beetles as well is that you don't want to use a beetle bag. I've seen lots of these being sold at different farm stores and garden stores throughout um, our area, and what you'll see is that they'll have a bag that's supposed to be laced with a pheromone, some kind of chemical attractant that'll make the beetles fly into the bag and hopefully die in there. And the bags work. They work very, very well. But unfortunately, Japanese beetles have a very sensitive sense of smell. And you'll begin drawing in not only the Japanese beetles from your own yard, but also yards from miles around you. And you'll keep bringing in more and more. These things do not work. They actually make a problem worse. So please, don't use a beetle bag. 
Now the larva of these plant, of these insects actually survive in the ground. They'll consume the roots of grass and other plants. So the damage that usually we're concerned with is mainly being done by adults. And you'll never probably never see the larva or the big grubs of Japanese beetles. So our leaf cutter bees are an example of that moment where it's best to do nothing. Now what this is, this is a native pollinator. It is a bee. They do have um, a burrow that they will keep their young in. They aren't that social. And what they'll do is that they will cut out parts of leaves of the plants. And what they do is they use those parts to create their own burrow. So that way they can hide their young and be able to feed them safely. When they attack our plants, they're not actually trying to consume anything. They're just getting parts for a house. Now this is, like I said, a native species, so we want to make sure we protect them. We need them as pollinators, and they if we keep them here, they will help us grow our plants more effectively. So what I would say is if you see a leaf cutter bee, just let it go. Um, the best thing there is to do nothing, let it do its work, and that way uh, we can make sure that they are able to continue to pollinate for us. And I saw someone try to share something there, and we can address that at the end of the program. All right, let's keep going. So spider mites. This is one of our nastier ones, especially inside of a greenhouse. Spider mites are not insects. They are a type of organism that's more closely related to spiders and scorpions. And unfortunately, they are very common, especially in certain conditions, like the ones you would see within a greenhouse. You'll know that spider mites are present because you'll begin to see this uh, thick webbing-like tissue develop over, the, over across the leaves and on the stems. The picture you're seeing right now is a particularly bad infestation. The webbing is so thick that you can kind of see it's making the whole plant opaque. Now, what they do, a spider mite will drain the sap from the underside of a leaf, kind of like an aphid will. However, they're very tiny and very difficult to see. The most common one that I've personally seen is the two-spotted spider mite, which you can just barely see with the naked eye. And I have terrible vision, so I know a lot of you should be able to see it if you look. Now, the conditions that cause spider mites to thrive are if a garden isn't monitored very well. If you've got a stagnant garden with decent amount of heat and sometimes a little bit of moisture, you could see spider mites really begin to explode in plants. The good thing is though, is that spider mites can be easily treated. If you spray a high pressure blast of water across your plants, you can knock spider mites right off of the plants. They will not survive very easily off of a plant. and Most likely you will knock that population down pretty heavily. There are also several horticultural soaps, or insecticidal soaps, horticultural oils that you can apply to help control them. All right, we are just about done. So I want to talk a little bit about the rose slug sawfly. This is perhaps the most common insect pest that we see on roses. The damage it does is pretty well illustrated here. Oftentimes it is confused for damage being done by a slug, which is how it gets its name. And we refer to this damage as window painting. So a rose slug sawfly is actually, it's not a, a butterfly or a moth or anything like that. This is a small wasp related species. It's incapable of stinging. All they do is they, the, the adults are very tiny. They're very black. They'll just buzz around and you probably won't notice them at all. It's the larva that cause the biggest problems. The larvae, like I said, do this window painting damage where they scrape all of the leaf tissue off of the surface of the leaf, but they'll leave that one layer of tissue that kind of looks like a window and you can see light through it. Sometimes you will see them go all the way through the leaf, and I've got examples in my own yard right now where sawflies have been doing their work. Now while these guys do resemble caterpillars, they are a whole other kind of insect. So that means pesticides that are labeled for caterpillars, particularly pesticides containing the Bt uh, protein, won't necessarily work on them. Bt is not very effective. You're going to want to make sure that if you choose to use a pesticide on them, you get one that is labeled specifically for sawfly. However, in my opinion, manual removal is going to be the most effective way to handle sawflies. Uh, this way, you're picking them directly off. You just put them in a bucket of soapy water. 
There is no wait period there, um, and you can get that done and over with. Usually you're not going to see too many new saw flies develop on a plant, but it does of course mean you're adding to the manual labor you have to do to protect your roses. All right, so that is all I've got for you guys this evening. This one was a quick one tonight, so if you have questions, please feel free to ask. I've added contact information on here for all of you, as well as links to our Purdue Ed Store, which has a lot of great publications to help you figure out garden problems, agricultural problems, and a slew of other things. I've also put a link for the Purdue Plant and Pest Diagnostic Laboratory. They can help figure out what diseases are affecting plants. Um, we, they are still open for business, even in the pandemic, so they are a good resource to refer to. And I'm going to go ahead and send all of this information to you in the links after the recording is posted.